you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to lead things off with a presentation about what the ULIPO is, in case any of you are, you know, just wandered in from the street. Um, it's going to be sort of an elevator pitch about the ULIPO. I'm going to leave a lot out, but imagine that you and I were stuck in an elevator for like about 20 minutes. <laughs> There's just nothing to do but talk about experimental literature. And then like rescue help would come <laughs> in the form of booze. Um, so to, to ease into things, I'm going to read uh, the very beginning of Many Subtle Channels, which is a better, more uh, soundly, calmly reasoned description of the Ulipo that I could do extemporaneously. Um, everybody hear me okay? Cool. So the Ulipo, which is an acronym for Ouvroir de Littérature Potentielle, which means Workshop for Potential Literature, and the word Ouvroir also has the connotation of sewing circle, uh, just so you know. Um, is a sort of literary supper club, a hallowed echo chamber for investigations of poetic form and narrative constraint and the mathematics of wordplay. Since its creation in 1960, the ULIPO has served as the laboratory in which some of modernity's most inventive, challenging, and flat-out baffling textual experiments have been undertaken. Ulipian inquiry has yielded novels without certain vowels, love stories without gender, Poems without words, books that never end, books that do nothing but end, hmm. books that would technically take longer to read than most geological eras have lasted, books that share <laughs> the exercise of mourning, books that aim to keep the reader from reading them, books that exist for no particular reason other than to amuse and perplex, books that may not actually exist at all. These works, all of them governed in some way by strict technical constraints or elaborate architectural designs, are attempts to prove the hypothesis that the most arbitrary structural mandates can be the most creatively liberating. As you might imagine, it's difficult to be precise and literal about what, beyond a small Paris-based collective, the ULIPO is. The ULIPO itself prefers to be precise and literal about what it is not. It is not a movement, or an ism, or a school. It does not have an agenda, aesthetic or political or otherwise, it is not a scientific seminar. It is not invested in wrangling randomness or automatism or chance. It is most definitely not an offshoot of surrealism. It is concerned with literature in the conditional mood, not the imperative, which is to say it does not purport to tell anyone what literature should or must be. What it does is tell anyone who cares to listen <laughs> about what literature could and might be, sometimes by speculation, other times by demonstration. Positive definitions of the group are at least as diverse and at least as odd as its members. Its second president, Noel Arnaud, described it as a secret laboratory of literary structures. British newspaper The Independent described it as a mysterious, if not clandestine, organization that has long been a deliberately oblique part of French culture. <laughs> Martin Gardner in Scientific American as a whimsical, slightly mad French group. A snooty communist character in Harry Matthews' My Life in CIA described it as a gang of cynical formalists. <laughs> Philip Howard in the London Times as the French avant-garde coterie famous for its masturbatory and literary experiments, <laughs> and Michael Silverblad of the literary radio program Bookworm as a band of chess masters who have lost their boards. <laughs> <laughs> in essence, the Ulipo is a little bit of a lot of things. Sewing Circle and Secret Society, Museum of Bibliographic Oddities and Non-Lending Library, Analytic Think Tank and Cult of Counterculture. It is a place for les mordus de littérature, the incurably afflicted, the bitten. People preoccupied with the structure inherent in language, the calculation inherent in storytelling, and the possibility for mystery and mischief inherent in the smallest textual enterprise. It is a place, as the only official defini definition has it, for rats who build the labyrinth from which they plan to escape. <laughs> so, I'm going to give you a brief slideshow. <laughs> So imagine that there's a, like a projector and a copy of PowerPoint in the elevator that we're stuck in. <laughs> <laughs> and our story begins with these two dudes. On the left, you have Raymond Queneau, who was born in 1903 and died in 1976. Queneau was briefly and tempestuously a member of the Surrealists, and then I don't know, came to his senses. Um, worked his way up the totem pole at the extremely um, 
influential literary French publishing house Gallimard and um, took over the, the Pleiad edition series. And his most famous work at the time that the Olipo was founded was a book called Zazie dans le Metro, or Zazie in the Metro, about this little girl, this extremely profane, <laughs> dirty mouthed little girl who comes to Paris and all she wants to do is see the Metro, and the Metro is on strike. <laughs> on the right is Francois Le Lyonnais, who was born in 1901, died in 1984. Uh, more of a cat guy, as you can see. <laughs> he was trained as a chemical engineer and uh, grew up in the literary, sort of between the two wars, literary culture of Paris. He was friends with the Dadaists and um, met a lot of people, including Marcel, Marcel Duchamp, who was a sometime member of the Ulipo through his interest in chess. Um, he later went on to publish a lot of work sort of popularizing currents in mathematical thought. And he also spent a few years in a German concentration camp at Dora uh, because of his role in the French resistance to the Nazi occupation. Um, and see. so in 1960, there was a conference at a, in, a, in a French town called Cervisy La Salle about, it was devoted to Canot's work, and most particularly Zazie dans le Metro. And all, a bunch of French academics and writers and publishers came to discuss Zazie, and Canot, for his part, said absolutely nothing about Zazie. He just, like, doodled some equations and mumbled stuff about, like, fourth-degree literature on whatever chalkboard was in front of him. But at, uh, at this conference in Cervisy, a bunch of people who knew each other more or less well came together and talked about how great it would be if they could um, create a sort of working research group about the history of experimental literature. And that uh, dudes who I'm not going to show you pictures of because I didn't have the time to track them all, pictures of all of them down on Google, they are Jacques Pince, Jacques Duchateau, Jean Queval, Jean Lescure, Claude Berge, then later after Cerisi, there was Albert-Marie Schmidt, a guy named Latisse, and Arnaud, Noël Arnaud. Um, eventually, Marcel Duchamp became a member, although he only attended maybe one meeting ever. <laughs> if that. <laughs> one and a half meetings. Uh, Paul Brafford, uh, André Blavier, Ross Chambers, and Stanley Chapman. Um, during which time, during the first few meetings, and like it started in the, the beginning of 1961 and went on for the for the first few years. Initially, the group's called Celitex, which was this uh, seminar of experimental literature. And then Albert Marie Schmidt decided that a better name would be Oulipo. First, it was Oulipo, and then it was Oulipo, and everyone agreed. And posterity has borne out the fact that that is a much better name. Um, a couple of people involved were. Yes. Before you change, Paul is going to correct. I'd like to make so, a point. Um, so. Very important. It, you know, the, the name of the dog is Tai Tai. <laughs> the name of the cat is Sir Pensif. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're both members of the <laughs> Paul had occasion to point out the names of more feline and canine members of the Olipo <laughs> as the elevator pitch wears on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I believe there's a character named Sir Pensif in, um, in Jason Murphy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. In Paul's latest novel, some of which takes place at the self same City Lights bookstore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It happens to be a cat, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, a lot, of the, a lot of the initial members from the early circle of uh, founding Olympians were members of what was called the Collège de Pataphysique, or the, the college, college in French doesn't mean college, it means middle school, the middle school of pataphysics, um, which was a nearly inexplicable um, <laughs> current in mid-century European artistic thought. Um, Initially based around the works of Alfred Jarry, who was the guy who wrote Ubu Hua and uh, the Ubu plays, but more specifically in the case of pataphysics with a book he wrote about Dr. Faust Roll, who was a pataphysician, or a pataphysicist, depending on your translation. And pataphysics is described as the science of imaginary solutions. Um, I, there's a comment in my book about how anyone who claims to understand pataphysics is almost certainly lying to you, uh, which is a disclaimer that made it very handy for me to write an entire chapter about pataphysics. <laughs> but that was sort of the, um, 
the magnet from which a lot of the early members of the ULIPO funneled into the ULIPO. And initially, the ULIPO was a sub-commission of the Collège de Pédophysique, especially um, Noël Arnaud and Latisse. Latisse, who is next to Cano, who is second from the left in the back. Latisse is third from the left. Noël Arnaud is second from the right. And François Cavadec, who you will see in even more impeccably mustached glory in a few slides, um, is on the right, on um, kneeling down on the bottom. There's a quote that um, is often attributed to Perec, although it's doubtful that Perec actually said it, where, where he says that uh, if you have a brother and he loves cheese, that's physics. If you have a brother and therefore he loves cheese, that's metaphysics. If you don't have a brother and he loves cheese, that's pataphysics. <laughs> <laughs> Incontestably true. Um, the other thing that I'll just mention, I don't have a picture of it, is uh, the other sort of institutional influence on the early LIPO was a group called Bourbaki, which was a bunch of mathematicians who were working under a collective pseudonym of Nicolas, Nicolas Bourbaki um, to essentially rewrite the, the fundamental principles of mathematics in a, according to the axiomatic method. And a lot of their um, curious bylaws, shall we say, sort of anticipated the curious bylaws of the ULIPO, on which more anon. So the ULIPO um, proceeded in relative secrecy. They had the occasional guest at their monthly meetings, which were lunches, usually at uh, François Le Lyonnais' house in uh, the suburbs of Paris. For about five or six years, they just went on. And then at some point, um, it was decided that they should maybe get some new blood involved. And the first new blood was a guy on the left, Jacques Roubeau, who Cano had encountered um, through Galignon because he was about to publish his book, uh, the first book of poetry by Roubeau, uh, which was going to come out in 1967, called, the name of the book is the mathematical symbol that indicates that a term belongs to a mathematical set. It looks like an E, but it's, it's called signe d'appartenance in, in French. And um, Cano was tickled enough by this book, which was a work that picked apart the form of the sonnet in the form of a game of Go, the Japanese kind of somewhat chess-like game Go. Jacobo once uh, sternly reprimanded me by email for comparing Go and chess, but <laughs> as long as you, none of you tell him. <laughs> um, so they invited Wubo, and he came, he was a guest of honor at one of the ULIPO meetings, and uh, he was elected as a new member in 1966. And on his left, would you like to tell us who that cat is named? For security reasons, the cat was named the cat. <laughs> 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 On the right is Georges Perrac, who is um, just, he's the first, the first writer that a lot of people encounter when they learn about the ULIPO, especially in the U.S. Um, he's most notorious for having written a mystery novel that does not contain the letter E, and later having written a sort of racy, I don't know what to call it, but a racy novel that contains nothing but the letter E and all the other consonants. It doesn't contain A, I, O, U, or Y. Um, and Perec, became, Perec was the second recruit. He became a member in 1967. And um, we'll show you a little more about his work later on. But, so as the, um, as the recruitment of new members carried on over the next few years, a couple of somewhat strange bylaws emerged, as I alluded to earlier with the blue boxes. <coughs> Including that um, you can never resign from the ULIPO, you can never be uh, kicked out of the ULIPO, which is nice, but you can also never quit the ULIPO except in one case where you commit suicide with the express purpose of leaving the ULIPO in the presence of a notary. <laughs> <laughs> There's another bylaw that says that if you ever ask to become a member of the ULIPO, you are permanently ineligible for membership in the ULIPO. Um, that's all I want to say about these two dudes right now. Next is Marcel Benabou and this handsome dude with another cat, whom you see before you. <laughs> this one was Badwa. Badwa. This is mineral water. Sparkling. <laughs> <laughs> Sparkling. 
Marcel Benabou on the left uh, is now the, um, the secretary of the LIPO. For a time, Marcel and Paul Fournel, who is right here, uh, were respectively the definitively provisional secretary and the provisionally definitive secretary of the LIPO, and they switched roles depending <laughs> on day of the week, yes? Um, since then, Paul has become the president of the ULIPO, and Marcel is both definitively provisional and provisionally definitive secretary of the ULIPO. Um, Paul, it is worth mentioning for the purposes of self glorification also began his tenure, his involvement with the ULIPO as, uh, in a position called Esclave, which means slave, uh, doing extremely exciting grunt work for the ULIPO. And now he's the president. <laughs> also during this time, uh, Luc Etienne, who was a, who was a, uh, who was a, a, a teacher, joined the group. The next couple of recruits were these two dudes, uh, who both became members on Valentine's Day in 1973. On the left is Italo Calvino, and on the right is Harry Matthews, the first American member of the group, um, both of whom are authors of pretty extraordinary bodies of work that uh, I'm not going to be able to do justice to by describing them right now, so I urge you to discover them if you have not. No uh, cats. No cats. <laughs> no cats. <laughs> but Harry sort of looks like he could have a cat on his lap. <laughs> <laughs> That's gone. That's, the cat knows what it did. Um, in 1975, Michelle Metay was the first woman who was recruited to the ULIPO. She was um, a poet and a sinologist who does, and still continues to do a lot of really interesting work with Chinese poetry. She's the author of um, a chain of genitive phrases that, could, like, the blank of the blank of the blank of the blank, which goes on for, to this date, I think, about 30,000 blanks. Um, of which there will, uh, a short excerpt will be translated in a forthcoming issue of Words Without Borders. And on the right is the first publication that the LIPO put out in 1973 called La Literature Potentielle, which was basically um, not only the LIPO's first collective publication, not counting a very small run um, piece in the pataphysics, like trimesterly. Uh, publication. But this basically showed off a number of the, the techniques and forms and explorations that the group had, um, had crossed thus far. And here is a picture of a meeting. I don't know what year this, from, this is from. Um, this late, is the garden. late 70s? This is the garden of François de Lyonnais uh -huh. in boulogne billancourt Right. Mm -hmm. um, I would think late 70s, there's Calvino and Harry Matthews sitting cross-legged on the left. There's a not, cut... Not late 70s. Not late 70s? No, uh, Cunot died in 1976. Cunot died. So it's... Really right. Right. His head is on the table. That's Andre Blavier's head is on the table. Yes. Um, it was decapitated. Ah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Leo has had an extremely uh, tense relationship with the feline ever since. Um, so this is, as Paul said, a meeting in the garden of François de Lyonnais in the, in the mid-70s. Um, after that, there was a sort of a dark period in the history of Lugipo. Uh, there were several deaths. Uh, Cano died in 1976, Perec died in 1982, Luc Etienne and François de Lyonnais both died in 1984, and Calvino died in 1985. On the left is a, um, a tribute that uh, Luc Etienne wrote for Perec in shortly after his death. It's a it's a two dimensional palindrome. Mm -hmm. So sur le reads the same same way up and down and um, left to right or right to left down and up as you prefer. And uh, the only there there was sort of a, a almost a freeze on recruitment for the next several years, except for these two guys, François Caradec who you saw in the pataphysics photo earlier, who was actually uh, involved in the network of um, Ulipians for quite a long time, but due to a disagreement with one of the other founding members, didn't become a member until 1983. At the same time as Jacques Jouet, who also became a member in 1983, 
um, and is one of the most active and prolific members of the Ulibo to this day. And here's a picture of a meeting at Jacques Chouet's house in 1990. Marcel, Benabou, Michel Metal, Paul Fournel, Harry Matthews, Paul Brafort, Claude Berge, Noël Arnaud, François Caradec, and Jacques Chouet. A lot of enchanting facial hair. <laughs> No cats. <laughs> <laughs> no cats in sight. Um, and so recruitment picked up again a little bit in the early 90s. The handsome gentleman you see on the left, Révelle Atelier, in 1992. Michel Grongo, who is blurry, even in real life, she's extremely blurry woman, <laughs> um, who is just like a, a phenomenal writer of anagrams, um, was recruited in 1995. Also during this time, uh, Pierre Rosenstiel and Bernard Sarkilini, who I don't have a picture of those guys, and Oscar Pastor, I think, um, who is one of the Germanophone members of the Ulipo. Um, later on, Ian Monk in 1998 and Olivier Salon in 2000, He's looking very serious, Anne Garretta and Valérie Baudouin. Uh, and Gaeta is a sort of a militant postmodernist who has written a novel called Sphinx that is in the process of being translated in French. It's a love story in which, it's the love story without gender that I alluded to in the introduction that I read, which is to say that you never find out in French what sex either the, the narrator or the object of the narrator's affections is. And I, for one, am extremely excited to see how that gets translated into, into English where genders belong to possessors rather than objects that are possessed. And Valérie Baudouin um, became a member largely through her um, graduate work, which was on a computer program that can analyze metered French verse, which uh, her graduate work on that was supervised in part by Jacques Roubault. Next, there was Frédéric Forte mm. in 2005, and uh, somebody named Daniel Levin Becker uh, in, in 2009. It was a, a period of debate where I tried to find the silliest picture I could. And this one won out because the lighting was best. <laughs> uh, since then, there's Michel Audin, who's a mathematician from Strasbourg in 2009 also, and Etienne Lecroix, who is a cartoonist and a flagship member of a group called the Ubapo, which is the continuation of the Lipo by cartooning means, about which I will say slightly more later. And that uh, brings us up to the present in terms of recruits and members in the Lipo. So that's the personnel of the group. Now then, what do we do? This is, um, this is a, a table that was drawn up pretty early on. I don't remember what year exactly, but it's essentially, it's referred to as the Kuneliev's table, let's take off on Mendeleev's table of, in chemistry. And it basically is an attempt to pin down the different kinds of Ulithian work, the, like Ulithian ma manipulations. So the columns, which you can't see, I'm sorry, the rows that you can't see going down the left side are, there's letters or characters, syllables, words, sentences, and paragraphs. These are the things that you could manipulate. <coughs> and the columns going across the top, the ways you could manipulate them are in length, in number, in order, or in uh, nature. Which leaves a lot, of, um, a lot of room for interpretation, but that is, of course, the point. Um, so the name of my book, Many Subtle Channels, comes from a statement that Le Lyonnais makes in the second Ulipian Manifesto that says that Ulipian endeavor has two different uh, branches. There's analytical, which he calls anulipo, and there's synthetic, which he calls synthulipo. And analytical is basically looking at work, looking at literature that has already been produced and seeing what patterns you can, you can notice in it. And synthetic Ulipianism is basically making new patterns or making new work based on patterns that you found. And between those two things, he says, there are many subtle channels. So an example of the analytical <laughs> side of things is this text that Cano wrote about, he took a bunch of sonnets by uh, Mallarmé and read a bunch of them and determined that they were kind of redundant. 
and that maybe they would be better if you just lopped off everything but the rhyming bits at the end. <laughs> the haiku eyes do not rhyme. And these, this is the result. So they're very short, rhyming, essentially sonnet structured uh, haiku like pieces. But fairly quickly, the Ulipo became much more notable for its synthetic works, um, which, among other things, this is a good example at the, at the letter level. These are snowballs, where you have, for instance, you start a line with one letter, and then you add another letter, and then you add a third letter, and then you keep adding until you start subtracting it's a, an increasing and decreasing snowball, there are obviously many variations. What's interesting about these is that you keep the same letters each time, just basically make anagrams of them so that each new line makes, is, a, is a word. Um, here is an example of what's called Matthew's algorithm. Harry Matthews came up with this manipulation that you could do not only to letters, although it works with letters, as you can see on the right here, but it also works with sentences or with situations. <coughs> it's basically just an interesting um, verbal or phrasal or narrative motor, just a way you can permute situations to create new things. This is an example. This is a... Uh, a two-page spread from La Disparition, which is Perec's novel without the letter E, which is a mystery novel about a world in which the letter E has disappeared. And every time somebody comes close to being able to articulate what is happening, they spontaneously drop dead. There's a, this, this page, there's a, a really funny dialogue between a, like a sea captain and a barman. And a sea captain goes into a bar and orders a porto flip, which uh, is a drink that is made with egg white. And the word for egg in French, both sounds not unlike the letter E in French, uh, and so he's trying to explain, he's like, I'd like a port flip I don't know, I don't know why you can't make me one, I had one here like a month ago, and the barman keeps trying to explain, and finds it harder and harder to explain, and eventually just dies. <laughs> <laughs> but oof has an E in it, doesn't it? Yes, that's the point, that's why the barman can't explain. I see. Here is another, um, another few examples of uh, letter constraints. On the top left, there's what's called the, um, the prisoner's constraint, where you can't use any letters that have ascenders or descenders. So like the ascender is the, the bar that goes up in a B, and a descender is the bar that goes down in a P. And it's called the prisoner's constraint because you're supposed to imagine a guy in, in a prison cell who's got, a very, who's got a, a very limited amount of paper, and he's trying to write his memoirs. And he's got to conserve space as much as he possibly can. So he can't use any letters. He can't use B or D or F or G, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> and this is an example. I don't know if you guys can see it, but an example of a text written with a severely restricted vocabulary. Likewise, on the, on the right side of the page is um, what's called a monovocalism by Perec. It's a text in which there's only one vowel. So in this case, A is called, what a man. <laughs> Another constraint by Perec is called the heterogram, in which he takes the, fir the, thir uh, sorry, the 11 most common letters in, in the French alphabet, uh, which are the letters in the word ulcerations. In English, it's the word threnodials. But you use each of those letters once per line, and each line is an anagram of those letters. You can't use those letters again until you finish the line. In this case, there's a, a joker, like one of the other 15 letters from the alphabet that you get to use once per line. But after you've done this kind of Sudoku thing with the letters, you can also parse it out. And so, like, the first line says, cool, grisâtre au loin. And so, C-O-U-L-E-N-T, the joker is a G. R I S A, and then the line starts again. T R E S A O U, sorry, A U L O I N, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's extraordinarily difficult to do, extraordinarily difficult to translate, as you might imagine. And it's the sort of thing that Perec, because he was a complete crazy person, uh, was really fun and uh, just did a phenomenal job with. Um, another another form, not unlike the, uh, the heterogram. So. The heterogram is, as far as I know, something that Perec invented. But the lipogram, which is the term for a text written without a certain letter or certain letters, has a long, very colorful history that dates back to antiquity. Um, and 
This is another form invented by Olivian. This is uh, called the morale élémentaire, or the uh, elementary morality, invented by Canot in his last book of poetry, which was published in 1975. And the two sections, I think two sections, yeah. The first two sections of the book are dedicated to this form, where there are um, several sets of two-word phrases, which the noun modified by an adjective, a noun modified by an adjective, and then a set of uh, seven lines between one and five syllables, and then some more uh, nouns and adjectives, which is a really, it seems like a very rigid form, but it's actually got a ton of semantic and kind of narrative plasticity to it. Um, and the, the the book was called Morale Alimentaire, and the Ulipo turned it into a form and started riffing on it and gave, gave it the same name. This is another, um, wait, no, sorry, not ready. Um, my point about the existing forms, including the lipogram, was that the Olympians don't just invent things, we also use forms that exist already. For instance, the sonnet is a very good example. There have been many manipulations of the sonnet. Um, Jacques Bance, who was one of the founding members, wrote what he called irrational sonnets, which were based on um, the first five digits of pi, three, three, one, four, one, five, which add up to 14, which is the number of lines in a sonnet said, instead of having four lines, four lines, three lines, three lines, why not have three lines, one line, four lines, one line, five lines, with a kind of elaborate pattern of echoes. Frédéric Forte, who, um, whose picture I showed you may have been distracted by the picture of me being iced, bros, icing bros, um, has invented more recently what's called a flat sonnet, where he basically collapses the sonnet into prose that has internal rhymes, but you, you can't really tell the form of it by looking at it. Um, and another, let's see, another um, application of the sonnet was one of the, arguably the first Ulipian book, which is called um, Cent Milliards de Poèmes, or 100,000 Billion Poems, in which Cano wrote 10 different sonnets all of which I rhymed identically and cut each line into strips so that each, each strip could be combined, combined sorry, with any of the 10 others. So in theory, that engenders 10 to the 14th power possible different poems, which is a very good example of why this is called potential literature. <laughs> and it's also just kind of a stunning, stunning <coughs> object to behold. Elevator helps on the way. We're, we're <laughs> um, the sestina is another form. This is invented by a troubadour in the 14th century, and it's a form of poem where the end word, this is a graphic courtesy of Wikipedia, the end word permutes according to this spiral pattern. So you have the first line will end with a word, the second line will end with a word, and so on, and then the next in the next stanza, the first line will end with the end word from the sixth <coughs> line, and so on and so on. And that also, the Olympians write sestinas, but also like Paul, for instance, has written a number of terinas um, about his experiences living in the U.S. Um, Jacques Roubaud has a, a series of books called uh, the Hortense series, in which the narrative is based on a structure uh, that takes a lot from the, the pattern of the sestina. And Speaking of narrative, like novels whose narrative patterns are based on literary forms, that's um, some of the most stunning Olympian work has been based on that. So this is, on the left, is a, a painting, or sorry, a drawing by Saul Steinberg, the New Yorker illustrator, that really inspired Perec. He gave him the idea to write this novel in which um, the narration is divided up into the different spaces of an apartment building. And on the right, is the apartment building, each of each, uh, each grid square in the grid corresponds to a chapter in the book, and this book is called Life, a User's Manual. Um, and the way that the narration moves from room to room is based on this algorithm that determines the, uh, that's based on the way a knight moves around the chessboard. So up two over one, over two up one which was uh, mapped out for him by another Olympian named Claude Berge, who was a graph theorist. Um, and a lot, of other, a lot of other Olympian novels that I don't have quite as sexy pictures of are, do this, like Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. The, the story that's told between chapters is mapped out by something called a Grimas Square. Uh, Hervé Letelier's first novel, The Voleur de Nostalgie, also has a 
has a mathematical pattern behind it. His uh, most recent novel, Electric Code W, also does. Um, there is uh, a somewhat recent novel by Paul Forneau called Chamboula, which is essentially a choose-your-own-adventure novel where you don't get to choose anything. <laughs> it's, just, it's just all the permutations laid out in a row, uh, which is a completely lovely novel. Um, another permutation... Nope. Sorry. Another permutation is uh, a novel called Cigarettes by Harry Matthews, which um, I mention in part because it's, it's based on permutation and it's a very interesting novel, but also because it, it um, brings us to an interesting debate within the Uebo, which is the, uh, the merits of revealing to the reader the constraint that was used to write the book. That's something we can talk about later. Um, but Matthews, for instance, is staunchly opposed to letting the reader know what's going on. He thinks it's more, uh, it produces a more titillating reading experience uh, for you to know that there is something going on, but not to know what. And that if you're so focused on trying to discern the pattern, then maybe you'll miss the point of what the, what the work itself is. Other people like Jacques Jouet, most notably, are really staunchly in favor of letting the reader know because uh, if the structure that you use to build the story is important to the story, then chances are it's going to be so inseparable from the, the fabric of the content that the reader would be at a loss, would be losing something if he or she didn't know um, how it was composed. And there's another... the. The thing that is not really mentioned in the table of kinds of Ulipian work that I showed you is more recently there's uh, been a strain of procedural Ulipian constraints. For instance, Jacques Chouet has invented a form that he calls the metro poem or the subway poem, where you get on you get on the subway, and between the first two stops, you compose a line of poetry in your head. And while the train is stopped at the, at the first stop you get to, you write it down. And then when the train starts again, you think of another line and so on, and you can only think while the train is moving, and you can only write, you can't edit while the train is down. And then if you switch, switch lines to get, go to a different train line, you start a new stanza, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it's, it's interesting in part because the constraint is unverifiable. There's no, there's no way for anyone to say that Jacques Jouet didn't just decide to write a poem at random, occasionally mentioning things that he might have seen on the metro. And that's... Um, it's, it, it's not a totally new phenomenon in the Ulipo because there was also, even from the very earliest uh, Ulipian manipulations, there was one called the N plus 7 constraint, where you take a text, like for instance, the, uh, the fox and the crow, and every noun you replace with the noun seven entries after it in the dictionary. <laughs> um, so there's a history of what are essentially procedural constraints, but... Um, Interesting ongoing discussion, not so much a debate, but a discussion within the Ulipo. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is just about the sort of modern day life of the Ulipo, and it's given rise to a proliferation of what are called Uixpos, some of which Peter alluded to earlier. Um, there is a group called the Ulipopo, which was the first U something else po, the Li being literature. Ulipopo is the workshop for potential detective novels. Uh, this is an example of, this is a game made by the Ubapo, where Ba is bande dessinée. This is a game called Screw Babble. It's a game of Scrabble where instead of letters you have cartoon panels, and so instead of words you make stories. Um, there's the Ubupo for music, there's the Ufopo. I actually have a list that I've written down on this index card that I will go through very quickly. There's the Ulipopo, the Ukwipo for cuisine which was uh, extremely short-lived <laughs> experiment in constraint-based uh, eating and drinking. There's the Upampo for painting, the Utrapo for tragic comedy, the Ubapo, which is the cartooning, Uhispo for history. For instance, how would history be different if you removed one, one event from history? Like, had Hitler never come to power, where would we be today? Which is actually, uh, in parallel, a very popular and lucrative um, genre of subpar literature. <laughs> um, the Utipopo, which is very fun to say in French, and is the workshop for potential typography. 
U Ashpo architecture, U Grapo for grammar, U Bipo for basically looking for uh, lines in the Bible that are involuntarily constrained, U Geopo, potential geography, U Carpo, which is very new for potential cartography. There's a workshop for potential gardening, there's a workshop for potential pornography. There's all kinds of stuff which are, none of these are officially sanctioned by the Lupo. Some of them are officially sanctioned by the Collège de Pataphysique. Um, but the Ulipo maintains a sort of uh, calmly interested perspective on all of these things. Um, the screw babble is, is pretty excellent. Sorry. Upol Pot. Politic. The uh, workshop for potential politics and also the, uh, the name is not to Pol Pot. I actually <laughs> expressly didn't write that down on this index card because I didn't want to have to explain it. <laughs> but there you are. Um, and that's, that's all I'm going to say about the Lipo. That was probably more than 20 minutes, and I'm sorry. But help is here. We can all get out of this elevator, and you can start asking questions if you would like. Thank you.